You know, the 1990s sure do come up a lot in my videos. A large amount of the stuff I've talked about either directly comes from it or can trace its lineage back to that decade. And to some, it may be puzzling. I was born several years after the 21st century had already arrived and even made it clear on numerous occasions that I feel the 2000s, or in other words, the 6th generation, was the era when video games reached their creative peak. 3D gaming, especially in its earlier days, has always been the most compelling form of the medium if you ask me, and the 6th generation, made up of the Dreamcast, PS2, GameCube, and original Xbox if you don't know, is easily my favorite because of the sheer amount of great games I've experienced on its consoles, from long established IP and new contenders alike. Now that's of course just my subjective experience, but still. With all that said though, I still have a fascination and respect towards games from the 90s. In my opinion, it's the decade where games really came into their own, moving past the mistakes, trial and error, and growing pains that plagued the industry during its earlier formative years. During this time, so many series made their mark in the industry, and many continuously set the bar for what could be done in the medium. Many of you are probably thinking of franchises like Mario, Zelda, Kirby, Mega Man, Metroid, or of course, the main topic of discussion on my channel as of late, Sonic the Hedgehog. And yeah, all of those series and more were definitely important and produced numerous good to great works. However, there's another series from around this time that I'd say is not only on par with, if not exceeding, many of the offerings of its contemporaries, but is one I'd say is just as deserving of the high praise that those contemporary franchises get. That series is, of course, none other than Donkey Kong Country. Ah, Donkey Kong Country, or DKC as I'll probably call it from now on for brevity's sake. Much like Sonic, it's a series that I only got into less than a decade ago, in fact almost a whole year before I played my first Sonic game, but goddamn me if it doesn't feel like it's been a lifetime since then, I've returned to these games pretty frequently. Not as much as some other games, and I have stopped revisiting them as often as I used to after playing other stuff, but I always end up coming back eventually. These games are among the best side-scrollers ever made in my opinion, so why not talk about them? But before I do that, let me take it back really, really really far. I, I, I suppose. Back in 1981, a little known company that had just recently entered the fledgling video game market was pursuing the license to create an arcade game based on Popeye. You know, they were a small startup you probably never heard of called uh, Nintendo. Nintendo. Yeah, so interestingly enough, Nintendo was planning on creating a Popeye arcade game because Shigeru Miyamoto really loves Popeye, didn't you know? Eventually though, this licensing deal fell through and not wanting to get rid of the concept, Miyamoto instead thought of a similar premise just with different characters. Popeye was replaced by a carpenter originally known as Jumpman, who as you know would evolve into everyone's favorite chubby Italian plumber Mario, and in place of Olive Oil was Pauline. Yeah, not Princess Peach, it would take a few more years until she debuted. However, the character of interest today, or you could say, the ape of the hour, was the replacement for Bluto, the game's title character Donkey Kong. He was, well, a massive gorilla. Yeah, some real deep cut commentary you can only get on this channel. His name was inspired by King Kong, to the point Universal even filed a frivolous lawsuit over it funnily enough, using the word Kong to mean huge ape, and Donkey to mean stubborn. When Donkey Kong came out in arcades in 1981, it quickly became a huge hit and cemented itself a spot in video game history. It also paved the way for the Super Mario series, which I believe needs no explanation, which would eventually end up overtaking DK in popularity. The series would receive some more games, including two arcade sequels and a bunch of Game & Watch handhelds, but for the most part, once Mario himself became Nintendo's main mascot, DK took a backseat. He had pretty much no games after 1985, and people slowly but surely began to forget about him. All the while, other franchises like Zelda, Metroid, Kirby, and of course Mario would explode in popularity. It was looking like DK was pretty much a thing of the past, and like he would remain nothing but an arcade mascot known for simple high score attack games. Or at least for a long while he would. This wouldn't last forever though, and come the mid-1990s, Nintendo would look into reviving their old ape mascot for a new generation of console hardware. However, it wouldn't be made by only them, or well, at least not all of them would. There was a Donkey Kong game that came out on the Game Boy in mid-1994, but you still played as Mario trying to save Pauline from the huge ape. No, instead, they were preparing to oversee a full-on reboot of the series, which would expand it beyond the confines of its humble arcade origins. And the honors of creating it would be handed off to a little development studio from the British Isles. In the village of Twycross, which lies within Leicestershire, a ceremonial county in the East Midlands region of England, entrepreneur brothers Tim and Chris Stamper had founded a game development company known as Rare Limited, or as it's more often known Rareware or simply rare. Founded in 1985, after the brothers sold but later bought back a minority stake of their previous company, Ultimate Play the Game, Rare focused on development for the NES, thus building a business relationship with Nintendo early on. In the 1990s, Rareware employees would purchase a set of expensive silicon graphics workstations, which enabled them to render advanced 
well, at least for the time they were advanced 3D graphics. Nintendo, impressed by what Rare could do, was looking for something that could compete with the Aladdin game on Sega Genesis. That game had achieved impressive visuals with the help of real Disney animators, and it had been a huge blow to Nintendo's answer to the Genesis, the Super NES. Seeing this as a perfect opportunity, Rare was commissioned by Nintendo to use this then-advanced technology to create an SNES platform with pre-rendered visuals, deciding to allow them to use one of their existing IP. The one they chose was Donkey Kong, because it was low risk, and they figured if the project didn't work out, well, no harm, no foul. With the ape receiving a redesign from Rareware artist Kevin Bayless, which gave him his now iconic red tie, Rare would begin working on the game that would eventually become Donkey Kong Country. Needless to say, this game was really hyped up. Its visuals were quite a bit more advanced than anything else in the market at the time, and as a result, it was at the center of an aggressive, multi-million dollar marketing campaign that essentially fired back at those Genesis does what Nintendo don't ads Sega had created. It made things absolutely clear. This game would not be on Sega consoles, not on 32X adapters, not on CD-ROM, it would only be available for the SNES, and to top it all off, much like other SNES games that boasted advanced visuals and whatnot, it's just the cartridge, fully playable with no other strings attached. When released in November 1984, the game was met with strong acclaim, with critics praising not only the game's visuals, but also its music and gameplay, the latter of which in particular was favorably compared to Mario. DKC sold extremely well, eventually becoming the third best-selling SNES game of all time and the best-selling game of the Donkey Kong series, and many people consider it a huge reason why Nintendo eventually won the fourth generation console war. After its success, Nintendo would officially purchase a 49% minority stake in the company, making them a second party developer not unlike Game Freak. I know there's several other second party Nintendo studios, but that's the only one I can confirm that they actually owned a large stake in like they did with Rare. Regardless, my point is that DKC was a very successful game, and it went on to spawn a few sequels, an N64 collectathon, several ports and spin-offs, and even an eventual revival for Metroid Prime developer Retro Studios. As for me, like I said, Donkey Kong Country was one of the first games I played when I picked up my SNES back in late 2017. That was the year I had gotten into this whole collecting thing, and while I was healing from a badly fractured leg, I got an SNES along with a decent sized lot of games. There were a few games I had wanted to play in the lot, including Super Mario World, and of course, the first Donkey Kong Country. As with many retro games I hadn't previously known about, I had heard about it from YouTube videos, and as soon as that SNES finally arrived, this game quickly became one of the main things I used to pass the time. It was a game that captivated me, and it's one that makes me oddly nostalgic for that time I spent bedridden. I just distinctly remember playing the game for hours on end on that laggy flat screen with literal RF video, learning special tricks, cursing whenever I died, and celebrating whenever I passed a particularly tough section. I found it really hard to put the controller down, and would even eventually go on to achieve full completion, something I very rarely do for side-scrollers. I just really liked the game and wanted to get the most out of it, and my love for this series was only further cemented when I played the sequels. I think the series is excellent and more than deserving of the praise it gets, but that being said, I sadly don't see it get talked about nearly as much as something like Mario, Sonic, or Kirby, and that's a damn shame. So with the Sonic talk taking a bit of a backseat for now, I felt like giving these games a look and examining why I love them so much. Heads up though, in the interest of not making another huge ongoing retrospective, I'll only be covering the original trilogy, so no Donkey Kong Land, no DK64, and no Returns games. I wouldn't be opposed to doing those games at some point in the future if I ever feel the urge, but it's strictly going to be the SNES games for now. That same line of thinking also applies to the ports and remakes these games got, so I also won't be diving very deep into the Game Boy Color remake of the first game, nor the GBA remakes of the whole trilogy got, so if you came here for coverage of the remakes, you'll want to look elsewhere. But anyways, with all that said, it's Donkey Kong time. Sit back, relax, and of course, I really hope that you all enjoy. When you start this game up, it immediately starts oozing with charm and character. The Rareware logo comes in, all shiny and golden and the game fades into the intro I showed a bit earlier. You see this elderly Kong named Cranky, who's actually the original arcade Donkey Kong, use an old gramophone to play the theme to the original DK arcade game, which gets interrupted by DK himself dancing to a remix of the theme on a boombox. Cue Cranky tossing a literal TNT barrel onto him, as DK freaks out so much that his eyes poke out of his head. Yeah, Cranky legitimately tosses a live explosive at his grandson just because DK interrupted him and got on his nerves. So that's just set the tone for what the interactions between characters and the presentation of the story in this game are like. In short, it's not serious whatsoever and features an almost Monty Python-esque sense of humor. Well, who knows, maybe that's a bad comparison, and maybe I'm only saying it because both come from the UK. But with the fourth wall breaks and the physical comedy that a lot of the humor in this game is based around, I don't know, it just kind of reminds me of that. Anywho, I'm kind of jumping the gun a little bit. I haven't even started to delve into what this game is about. Well, it's extremely simple. 
blunt even. One night, while Donkey Kong and his nephew Diddy are minding their own business, a group of dastardly reptiles known as the Kremlings, led by King K. Rule, very clever name there, show up to DK Island. While DK isn't looking, they stuff Diddy into a barrel and seal DK's most prized possession, his banana hoard. When he wakes up the next morning, he breaks Diddy out of the barrel and noticing that his bananas are gone, he teams up with him and the rest of the Kong family, including his grandfather Cranky, girlfriend Candy, and... I don't know, stoner friend Funky Kong, to chase after the Kremlings, get his bananas back, and teach those bastards a lesson they'll never forget. And that's pretty much it. Yeah, again, this story isn't really anything particularly mind-blowing. And with this being an SNES game, I wouldn't expect it to be any more complex than something like that. There's pretty much just one small cutscene establishing the plot, where going into the cave underneath DK's house shows him getting upset at the loss of his banana hoard. It's quick and establishes what's going on entirely without words, and then leaves you to your own devices in playing the game. In other words, it's a standard side-scroller excuse plot, and and sometimes you don't really need anything more than that. I should mention that the GBA version does have a more in-depth intro though, so that's cool. And useful for a guy like me who needs extra visuals to describe the shit he's talking about. But it really serves as just some extra flavor to an already really simple plot. With all that said though, Rareware didn't get lazy with the story adjacent elements in this game, in spite of their simplicity, and balanced the somewhat bare bones plot with an entertaining cast of characters. I already mentioned Cranky Kong, who is the original DK from the arcade games and the current DK's grandfather. No, I have no idea who Donkey Kong's father is. He never appears in this game, or even at all in the series for that matter, so like Eggman's father, he's a complete mystery. I'm thinking way too much into this. Cranky is a, well, cranky old man Kong who sits in a rocking chair at his cabin all day, and he offers hints for some of the game's secrets. When you talk to him, he constantly breaks the fourth wall, complaining about how these new games are too soft or hold your hand and other boomer stuff like that. In essence, he's one of those gaming grandpas that insists the stuff from back in his day was so much better than this new crap. He's a really entertaining character and probably my favorite of the extended Kong cast. By contrast, my least favorite is probably Candy Kong, DK's girlfriend, because I don't find her very standout, and Funky Kong a surfer dude type Kong that operates Funky's flights, which lets you fast travel between worlds is somewhere in the middle. I don't know, the other two Kong family members don't really appear that much in this game, or at least they don't have as much dialogue as Cranky does, so I don't find them as memorable as he is, although they're still welcome inclusions. Moreover, the game's two playable characters, Donkey and Diddy Kong, have a pretty entertaining dynamic on their own that's not conveyed through any dialogue, but rather animation. Which reminds me, when you're talking about the Donkey Kong Country trilogy, it's impossible to avoid a discussion of the game's graphics. Put simply, it was one of the series major selling points back in the day, and a large reason why the games diverted so many people's attention away from Sega's offerings, placing it squarely on the SNES. Donkey Kong Country is easily one of the most distinct looking games on the SNES, with its pre-rendered visuals that almost look like they shouldn't be possible on the system, and yet they are. Now, I've used the phrase pre-rendered to describe the visuals in this game a couple times, but I haven't yet explained what that means. I mean, video game graphics have to be created by the developers while the game is made, so isn't every game pre-rendered, thus making the descriptor redundant? Well, not exactly. Pre-rendered graphics refers to when one of the game's graphical assets is rendered in advance, rather than being produced by the hardware in real time. If you need an example, think of those CG cutscenes from old optical-based games. The video on display was way too advanced for the console to render on its own, so the scenes were rendered into video files and then compressed to fit on the disc. An even better example would be the monsters from the original Doom games, where they compressed photos of models they made into sprites so that they'd be really detailed. Rare basically did the same thing as that for the visuals of Donkey Kong Country, except they used 3D models and environments rendered on their SGI workstations rather than actual physical sculptures to create them. I can imagine using such a technique was a challenge, since Rareware had to balance compression so that the game's assets could all fit on the cartridge, and detail so the characters and environments would look good and make an impression on players, and I'd say they achieved this balance pretty well. Admittedly, I wouldn't say it's aged perfectly, and there are some aspects I can point out as somewhat dated. When viewed in their uncompressed form, I'd say the models are kinda chunky and weird looking, which comes with the territory of old computer graphics. If anything, I find the renders charming in spite of, and perhaps largely because of their roughness. Additionally, I feel the color palette is a little bit, I don't know, I guess limited is the best word. The colors are pretty nice and vibrant, but outside of a few levels here and there that break the mold, a lot of the game stages are mostly covered in green, brown, gray, and white, with the occasional blue. Not bad in and of itself, but it can lead to some of the levels blending in with each other, which kind of goes hand in hand with the somewhat restricted theming. This game takes place in the Kong's homeland, a huge jungle island by the name of DK Island. As it turns out, that namesake means way more than it just being the place Donkey and his family live, because this place is quite literally shaped like him. Honestly, I think it's pretty cool 
cool we get to see the island like this, and despite being on a quest to save his banana horde, as well as some spikes and tension here and there, this whole journey feels very relaxed and almost laid back, as if DK is taking a stroll through his island along with Diddy rather than rushing to save his bananas. Having said that though, while I do think DK Island is a pretty neat setting, and one that's also quite fitting for a clan of apes with its jungles and whatnot, I also find that it can be a little lacking in pizzazz sometimes. Don't get me wrong, the amount of detail that went into these environments is genuinely impressive for a Super Nintendo game, both in the actual level geometry itself and the backgrounds. Some stages even have dynamic color palettes, which allows for things like sunsets, others have unique weather effects such as rain or snow, and they make solid use of parallax scrolling and foregrounds to give the environments more life. Some, like the water stages, even use some sick mode 7 effects to achieve that extra bit of depth. In addition, there's also some particular level themes that really stand out to me. These treetops levels with the Endor inspired tree houses are pretty cool and include some neat environmental storytelling. The ground level forest stages from Vine Valley stick out from the rest of the game's jungles and whatnot. The ice caves are mystical, albeit sadly underutilized. Both the Misty and Standard Mines have a solid atmosphere, and I just love everything about the factory stages and Kremkrok Industries. This game's setting can be really distinctive, and at the very least, I find every type of environment really appealing to look at. I also like how in most cases, even when a theme appears multiple times, there's often slightly different color palettes despite using the same tile set. Even with that in mind though, when I examine the bigger picture, I kind of find the theming in this game a bit weak. I mean, it's clearly supposed to be themed around a jungle island, but this theme is kind of a background element that doesn't really strongly affect other aspects of the game's visual design. I find the various worlds and other visual aspects don't really come together and create a distinctive visual identity, which leaves the overall theme of the game feeling kind of, I don't know, I guess you could say generic, maybe? I really like when games have a distinct theme because it forces the developers to get creative with settings that stick to it, but in the case of DKC1, the theme is kind of vague and only half there. It feels like we're going through a more general island with jungles, massive cliff sides, forests, tundras, and a huge underground cave system, rather than a strongly identifiable area, if that makes any sense. What further makes me feel this way is the somewhat repetitive world themes. For one, there's two cave worlds, Monkey Mines and Chimp Caverns, and their levels look essentially the same as each other. There's also Congo Jungle and Vine Valley, which admittedly do look distinct from one another, but still have very similar themes, and Gorilla Glacier, which is a pretty standard ice caps world save for a few really standout stage aesthetics. The most distinct world has to be Kremkrok Industries, like I said, but even that area still has a couple cave stages. The point I'm trying to make here is that, while fairly pretty and detailed, something about DKC1 just makes these environments feel a little dry to me. I wouldn't go so far as to call the game forgettable visually, but it doesn't really leave a strong, lasting impression on me. It's not the kind of game I'll think back on and go, yeah, that game has insanely creative and standout environments. It looks great for sure, but if you ask me, it doesn't really do much to stand out from its contemporaries in terms of the actual pure art direction itself. But do you want to know what absolutely does do that? While this game has somewhat standard theming, it fires on all cylinders when it comes to animation and sprites, which I'd say are bursting at the seams with charm, character, and expressiveness. Rare Rare could have just made these pre-rendered sprites and called it a day, and most people probably wouldn't have blamed them. But they didn't do that. They went the extra mile and gave DK, Diddy, and everyone else, including the enemies and whatnot, very expressive animations that convey their personalities really well. I mean, even something as simple as the two apes stumbling when you walk close to the edge of a pit, or Diddy throwing his hat on the ground in anger when you lose a bonus minigame, just give them so much more character than your average sprite-based game. It almost makes them feel like living, breathing characters, rather than just pixels on a screen. I also love the way the animations themselves look, with that distinct type of movements they have. Sure, some may find the puppet-like motions the sprites have off-putting or even uncanny, but I definitely don't. I also have to mention the game's enemies, the Kremlings. Like I said, they're a band of villainous crocodiles and other reptiles that stole DK's banana horde, and I think they're a really fun cast of baddies. For one, crocodiles sometimes prey on monkeys in real life, so you could argue it's a fitting enemy based on that alone. But I also like the contrast of how we're playing as warm-blooded creatures, or in other words, mammals, fighting against cold-blooded ones, a bunch of reptiles. Now their side also has some mammals, such as Naughty the Beaver, some birds such as Neki, and insects like Zingers, but they were probably bribed by the Kremlings to help them guard DK's stolen bananas. And in the case of Zingers, well, B will be bees. Bees will bees be. Bees, bees will be. <laughs> Much like the Kongs, in a nice bit of parallelism, almost everything involving the Kremlin starts with the letter K, even including the name of their leader, King K. Rule, a clever pun on that thing some people do where they abbreviate their first name. The various classes of Kremlings all have their own personalities, like how critters appear devious as they jump around, clap traps act vicious in their pursuit of food, and how clumps and crushes both brush off ditties jumping on them like it's nothing. Much like the main cast of Kongs, each enemy sticks out on their own, and as a result, I find them just as memorable as said main characters. They're one of the many things that makes this game, and 
as you'll see, the series so distinct and memorable when compared against the sea of mascot platformers from the era. So yeah, don't take any nitpicks I mentioned with the graphics as a dig, because I think DKC is a really nice looking game in spite of them, and I can see why it made such a splash in the industry with how unique it looks for the era. And really, I can say almost the exact same thing about this game's soundtrack. Alongside their pre-rendered visuals, the DKC games are renowned for their musical prowess as well. I mean, take a look around YouTube alone, and you've likely seen covers, reimaginings, and even fan restorations of these songs with high quality versions of the original samples that were used. And I'm sure you've all seen the checkpoints. You know what I'm talking about. And if you don't, what's wrong with you? Anyway, people absolutely love the music in this series, which of course includes this first game, and I wholeheartedly agree with every bit of praise this collection of tracks receives. The music of Donkey Kong Country was composed by famed Rareware musicians Evelyn Novakovic, Robin Beanland, who would later work on Conker's Bad Fur Day, and of course, David Wise. Together, these three composers really knocked it out of the park. I absolutely love the soundtrack in this game. The songs have incredibly memorable melodies that complement the gameplay nicely, putting the orchestral sounding sample-based MIDI capabilities of the SNES to great use. I know MIDI is sometimes used as a derogatory term in music, occasionally being used to describe songs created using the sequencing technique as flat or robotic sounding, but as with everything else, the art of sequencing music is another skill. Much like the chiptune of the NES or the FM synthesis of the Genesis, the quality of the music made for the SNES's sampling capabilities is almost entirely dependent on how skilled the composer is with the hardware. In my opinion, Wise, Beanland, and Novakovic clearly know their way around the SNES sound system, and the music in this game is iconic for good reason. As I said a second ago, the actual compositions themselves not only fit the game and its environments quite well, but I also just love these songs in general for their memorable melodies which make the game all the more enjoyable to play. They're all really smooth courtesy of the system's Sony sound chip, say that shit fast 10 times, and on top of that, many of the tracks feature an impressive degree of atmosphere, with frequent use of contextual environments sound effects to weave an appropriate soundscape for the level you're playing into its music. For instance, the famous song for the opening level in what's essentially Donkey Kong's de facto theme song, Jungle Hijinks, or DK Island Swing, opens up with the sound of a dense, well, jungle, as a drum beat slowly fades in. After that, it progresses into the iconic melody that would define Donkey Kong as a character for years and even decades to come afterwards. And then it resolves to a sequence of ambient percussion and woodwinds that give a feeling of foreshadowing, like the game is preparing you for the trials Donkey and Diddy will encounter on their quest to get their bananas back. This song is but one of many in this game that expertly combines melody and atmosphere, creating an extremely appealing sound. That's a staple of this series' music, the tracks composed by David Wise especially, and I absolutely love it. Admittedly, I do feel that some tracks are a little overwhelming when it comes to the atmosphere though, to the point of overpowering the melody. I wouldn't call any song in this game bad, but certain ones are just not as memorable as others in my opinion. For example, Cave Dweller Concert, Voices of the Temple, Northern Hemispheres, and Misty Menace aren't tracks I immediately think of when this game comes to mind because they tend to emphasize a dour, atmospheric tone above everything else. That works in creating an effective atmosphere, particularly in the case of Northern Hemispheres and Misty Menace. The former is a perfect audible representation of the feeling of an impending blizzard. While the latter has genuinely left me unsettled in the past, namely one particular occasion when I was playing this game at night. It's a surprisingly creepy song with its constant pickaxe and hammering sounds, which I imagine as the ghostly echoes of long deceased miners, reverberating through the mines as if their deaths left behind some sort of permanent record on the rocks themselves. You can hear it loud and clear. Okay, now I'm definitely looking way too far into this, but that's the impression I get from this track. So yeah, these songs are some of my lesser favorites despite the praise I just gave, because in a fast-paced platformer like this, I generally prefer songs that either strongly emphasize melody or blend it with atmosphere much like Jungle Hijinks. Thankfully, this game has plenty of songs that take that exact direction, and those are among some of my favorites from the entire SNES library. If I had to list some favorites, a few contenders that come to mind would include Life in the Mines, for its amazing combination of lively mining sounds and woodwind instruments. I 
Ice Cave chant excellently emphasizes the shiny ice crystals in its cave, and it sucks that the game only uses this song in setting once. And Fear Factory is just downright incredible with its dangerous yet triumphant sound, which makes it feel like your journey is nearing its end. I also really enjoy the map theme, Simeon's Segway, and it sounds like a song that would be playing when a game is left idle in a dentist's office or something. Just sitting there waiting for some kid to pick it up and start playing while waiting for their appointment. There's so many tracks that feature similar qualities, so why not take a listen to some more of my favorites? I think I've more or less spoken my piece on this soundtrack. Not every last one of its songs are 100% memorable across the board, but the ones that nail it really do. However, there's one track I've been intentionally glossing over. It, beyond a shadow of a doubt, gets my pick for the game's most spectacular track, and the story behind its creation is one I feel the need to tell too. So, as David Wise was composing many of the songs for this game, he was impressed by what the Stamper Brothers were able to program on the SNES, and felt the need to go the extra mile in the songs he was making. Having been a composer at Rare for several years at that point, he had experience making music for the NES. A system that allowed for long, continuous notes to be played. When planning the track for the game's water levels, I imagine Wise was impressed by the depth provided by the Mode 7 background those stages had, and got the idea to create a song with similarly extended notes to reflect that. In other words, a continuous waveform of sorts. The issue was, by default, such a thing was beyond the SNES's capabilities, because it only had 64 kilobytes of sound memory. As a result, music for the system was typically created by making a bunch of short samples and then piecing them into music in real time, varying their pitch and length as necessary rather than having a continuous synthesized waveform sound, because there wasn't enough space and RAM for that. That was until David devised a clever trick that exploited the way in which the synthesizer he used, the Korg Wave Station, output its notes. Its sound, much like like any other synth, came out as raw binary bytes, which could be translated to hexadecimal, a format the SNES could read. So guess what David did? He generated the waveforms he wanted, and then took the raw binary and translated it to hex for a more memory efficient way to produce the sounds he wanted. There was probably more to it than that, including like compression and whatnot, but still. In the end, this resulted in the one, the only, aquatic ambience. Really, what more can I add about this song that hasn't already been said? It's usually the game's greatest track in my eyes, and that's for all sorts of reasons. To briefly summarize, it's such a majestic song that's absolute bliss in its purest form, featuring some of the game's strongest atmosphere. It really fits the expansive underwater space you're swimming through in these stages, with a leading instrument that I can only describe as fittingly aquatic, and the aforementioned continuous waveforms in the background, which take the form of what sounds like a violin of sorts, give it the song an almost mystical quality. I especially love this one bit from the song's intro, with the continuously rising note that wonderfully blends with the continuous cyclic tone going on, which produces an effect that creates a strong air of mystery, intrigue, and serenity all rolled into one. Man, what a masterful piece of aquatic ambience is, that's all I can really say. The song itself is incredible and I absolutely love it, with its tremendous emotional appeal and spectacular, almost magical melody. And I'd say the story of how David Wise created it is nothing short of remarkable. Sure, I have heard that creating music by directly writing the songs in hexadecimal wasn't unheard of in those days, and a similar technique was used for the game's other tracks, but knowing the hoops he had to go through to create this song in particular, apparently taking several weeks to fully complete, well it only makes me appreciate this song even more. I have somewhat of an idea how delicate 
not to mention difficult it is to work with such low level data, which was probably even more true back then, when there weren't nearly as many convenient tools to help in doing so, so I find it impressive the song turned out as incredible as it did. In my eyes, it's a technical achievement in every sense of the word, and really so is this soundtrack in general. Really so is this game in general. Again, I absolutely love this game's music, in the past, however long I spent talking about it, should reveal in vivid detail why that is. This soundtrack is an amazing combination of atmosphere and melody, and while it does skew a little too far in the direction of the former for my tastes every now and then, the high points of this collection of tracks stand tremendously tall and more than make up for the occasional weaker track. And of course, in this case, the term weaker is relative, because like I said, I don't dislike a single song in this game. I just find some more memorable than others is all. Fuck me, how many times have I used the word memorable, atmosphere, and melody in this section? Jeez. Regardless, great soundtrack, it was incredible way to set the standard for this series music and so early on to boot. Although speaking of boots, this game could be described as a sort of boot. A reboot! Okay look, I was thinking of some sort of transition and that one was really shitty, but you know what, just shut the fuck. In any case, yeah, as I said earlier, this game was a pretty significant reboot of the Donkey Kong series. As such, it significantly changes the style of gameplay from the original arcade titles. Whereas they were simple score attack games, in which you attempted to get the highest score possible while traveling through a set of a few one-screen stages, DKC takes a considerably more complex approach. It's instead a full-on side-scrolling platformer, completely axing the high score and focusing on the adventure and challenge in and of itself. As with any other platformer like this, the goal is to reach the end of the stage, all the while bashing baddies and avoiding hazards. To be honest, I've never been all that into classic DK, and it's mostly because of the simple arcade gameplay doesn't really hold my attention for very long. Because of this, the idea of DKC being a more in-depth Super Mario-esque platformer inherently appeals to me way more, because I find it a whole lot more compelling from the offset. Knowing how reboots sometimes go, this could've easily blew up in Rare's face, but as I've made no secret by now, I think this game more than succeeds in skulls. In fact, I would say they pretty much nailed it on the series' first go-around, albeit not without a few minor things that could use refinement here and there. To begin, I've gotta mention how smooth the movement feels. Earlier side-scrollers had significant troubles in this department a lot of the time, but thankfully since DKC came out long after the trial and error of the 1980s, Rare learned from the mistakes of other developers from back then and managed to craft a pretty damn solid movement system if I do say so myself. I get it, control is a very subjective thing that's hard to quantify, but in my experience, the control in Donkey Kong Country is really nice. The character's momentum is essentially perfect and their jumps have a very predictable arc that's easy to control and readjust if the need arises. The game also has a pretty solid implementation of dynamic jumping, which is when holding down the button makes you jump higher, which can be used to get a higher bounce when jumping on enemies, or can help with getting more precise barrel throws to take them out. Oh and by the way, yes, this game features barrels, a nice nod to the original DK arcade games, which you can pick up and toss for various purposes, most often for combat. There's the standard wooden barrels, which are simply meant for enemy bashing, steel barrels, which don't break upon hitting the ground or a wall, thus allowing you to roll on them, TNT barrels, which need no elaboration, and DK barrels, which bring your Kong buddy back after you lose them, since they act as an extra hit point. Speaking of which, the two playable characters, those of course being DK and Diddy, feel basically the same to control as each other, although with some minor differences to make each one stand out. In general, the two Kongs have their own strengths and weaknesses, which tend to balance each other out. Donkey Kong is strong in combat, being able to take out every enemy by jumping on their head, but he's comparatively slow and not as mobile. By contrast, Diddy has a faster running speed and jumps a bit higher, but he can't take out stronger enemies by jumping on them, and he instead has to use barrels or the somersault attack to defeat them. Generally speaking, I tend to prefer playing as Diddy because of his movement advantages, but also because he holds barrels in front of him rather than above his head, which makes it so you can have a shield against enemies rather than having to wait a second for him to throw it. Donkey Kong is still a perfectly playable character, and there's numerous situations throughout the game where he's the better option, but generally I tend to play as Diddy Kong for the reasons I've just described. I think it's a pretty neat dynamic, and what helps is that you're allowed to switch Kongs at any time using the select or A button during gameplay, so you're free to experiment with both whenever you have access to them. But anyway, back to what I was discussing before those tangents. I think the control in this game is near perfect, and if you ask me, it just seems like you can do anything with how perfectly balanced it all feels between being light and heavy. What makes it all the more fun is the inclusion of one particular move, that being the cartwheel, or as I referred to it a second ago, the somersault. Pressing the Y button while on the move will make your calling to a cartwheel, which as I said will allow you to defeat most enemies if timed properly. Not clap traps for obvious reasons, but in most cases it's a pretty powerful attack, even allowing Diddy to take out foes he otherwise couldn't without barrels. That being said, that's not why I love this move so much. If you use it on a ledge, the move will give you some coyote frames, which if you're not sure what that 
means it's when you're allowed a bit of extra time to input a jump after walking off a ledge. The mechanic gets its name from how Wily e. Coyote hovers in midair for a moment after running off a cliff, and in practice it's essentially a way for games to be more forgiving with their jumps. What I love so much about the mechanic in DKC is that its use entirely depends on your level of skill, since you're the one who has to initiate the Coyote frames rather than it happening automatically. If used skillfully, this move can make the game's pacing downright breakneck. If I had any nitpicks, I'm not too keen on how the Kongs tend to come to a stop after doing the move while on flat ground, but besides that, I love using this move and it's one of my favorite aspects of the controls. On the whole, the two main Kongs handle extremely well as I've been going into, and it makes this game a blast to play on its own. Complementing this is the sound design, which I feel makes the game even more satisfying to engage with than it already was. Attacking enemies causes them to make goofy sounds as they die, which adds to their personalities and makes it all the more fun to take them out. I also love how the barrels sound when they break after being tossed, especially when the TNT barrels blow up, which really sells the massive damage you just did to the enemies through sound. All in all, this game is pretty polished as far as the controls, movement, and player feedback go, and in general, I think it just feels really good to play and master as a result. But that's not quite it. In addition to the main Kongs, DKC also takes a page from Super Mario World and includes a few animal buddies, which function very similarly to Yoshi from that game. They're found in crates hidden around certain stages, and freeing them allows you to jump on their backs and ride around, which extends your moveset in some way. Rambi the Rhino is an absolute killing machine that's hella fun to dominate enemies with, even if I personally think his controls are a little too stiff and heavy for the their own good, as fitting as that is for a rhinoceros. Winky the Frog, one of the most common buddies, is another one I find useful, because he jumps really high while also having the destructive power of Rambi except from above, with him even being able to jump on zingers and use them as platforms. All things considered though, my favorite buddy in the game is probably Ungard the Swordfish, who is essentially the underwater version of Rambi. I personally think the normal underwater controls are a little sluggish, since this is one of those games where your controls change to a swimming scheme when underwater. Your Kongs automatically sink and you have to keep mashing the button to travel upwards or maintain your depth in the water. So on guard allowing you to do nothing else but hold the direction to swim, as well as letting you stand still and not sink to the pond floor, makes these stages more manageable. He's also an absolute powerhouse in his own right, being able to eliminate basically every enemy with a stab attack. Needless to say, I love using on guard, and always go out of my way to find him in every single water level. On the other hand, if I had to choose my least favorite animal body, it's gotta be Express of the Ostrich. He has no combat capabilities, and in my opinion, his ground movement is a bit slippery. I do like his flight ability, which slows your descent after jumping, but other than that, he's the only buddy I don't actively jump out of my seat to get. In some cases, I'd even say he can be a bit of an active nuisance, but I'll get to that when I get to it. Oh yeah, and I should probably mention that Squawks the Parrot makes his debut in this game. I'm sure some people don't even remember because he's pretty underutilized, only appearing in the level Torchlight Trouble. All he does is follow the Kongs, light up the path before you, and fry your retinas if you try to turn around. <laughs> Anyway, I really like using these animal buddies, and what's really cool about them is that they offer a bit of an incentive to look around. Oftentimes, levels have nooks and crannies that feature a hidden animal buddy crate, which rewards your curiosity. For example, On Guard can be found in every water level, and there's several instances of hidden winky boxes in several levels, such as this one in Bouncy Bonanza that makes the end of the stage a bit easier, and if you jump on this one tire in Millstone Mayhem. I think that's really cool, but even with that in mind, and this may just be me, some of the animal buddies feel a bit underused, Rambi especially, because he only appears in the first stage in the game and then in two later on. Maybe that was intentional because he admittedly kind of does break the stages when you use him, but I still think it would have been cool to see him and the other buddies for that matter get a little more use, possibly even having stages designed around them. Although when you want to talk about designing stages, I think Donkey Kong Country is a great example of that done right. I think this game's stage design is one of its strongest facets, and it did excellently at setting the bar for the series going forward in this regard. That said, there's still some things here and there I think could use some refinement. When you look at this game in the big picture sense, it it may appear pretty standard and even unremarkable as far as side-scrollers go. DKC follows a very similar structure to the one that Mario 3 introduced. The game is divided into a few worlds, in this case six, which each have a map screen you access levels and gameplay services with, such as safe points or fast travel. Each world has about five to six stages in it, and you, well, platform through them. I basically already laid that out, so I need not elaborate. On the whole, this game appears pretty simple and understandable, and in many ways it is, but when you look closer and really think about the stages, you'll quickly see how well crafted each one is. In the game's early stages, it gradually teaches you the mechanics that are going to be in use throughout. DK's house has ledges you can jump on, allowing you to enter his house and jump on the treetops with some extra life balloons, which tells you that looking around is often rewarded with extra lives and other goodies. They then give you a taste of some of the game's enemies, like the nut-tossing Neckies, 
I just realized how weird that sounded. And then demonstrate animal bodies by giving you access to Rambi. Running forward with him will lead you into a wall that he can break open, which teaches the player about the game's hidden bonus minigames, which further rewards you with lives or bananas. And yeah, I forgot to mention that bananas are the equivalent to Mario's coins in this game, so that's cute. If you lose Rambi, you'll also learn about the two Kong's strengths and weaknesses with the clumps they place around, ending the level off with a neat sunset. Yeah, I'm aware I probably went way too in-depth right there on what's essentially an easy introductory level, but I think it speaks to the invisible language that is game design. When done well, you can ease players into the experience without having to stop them in their tracks with a bunch of pace-breaking tutorial text, thereby incorporating the learning process into the stages themselves and allowing them to learn on their own. In other words, it's pretty neat, and makes repeat playthroughs a breeze, since if you're experienced with the game, you can just go through the early levels without getting stopped to be told stuff you already know about. Despite how simple the game is to pick up and understand, however, it doesn't hold back on the challenge, and gradually builds in complexity as you progress. The DKC trilogy is well known for being tough as nails, and the first game is no exception to that. If you're new to the game, it can be pretty damn tricky at times, often requiring mastery over the Kong's moveset to make it through some levels in one piece. On my first run, I died countless times, although, to be fair, I was dealing with a disgusting amount of input delay due to having no other choice than using RF on a flat screen not set to game mode. Even after playing this game a lot of times in a bunch better setup, though, I can still sometimes get my ass kicked, especially if I haven't played the game in a while. And to be honest, I love it. While this game is hard, it's also very fair. It's an age-old tale, simple to pick up, but tough to master. If you're not used to the game, you're probably gonna die a lot, but as you play further and start to get better at things, you can get through with fewer and fewer mistakes. Each level is very accommodating to the control you're given, emphasizing the smooth physics the Kongs have, but also keep you on your toes by throwing elevating challenges in there as you progress, sometimes literally. What certainly helps is two simple things, the pacing and the various things each level does. As I've hinted at, I think Donkey Kong Country is paced very well. Well, you may have to engage in a bit of trial and error on your first time playing, these levels are built in such a way that you can blast through them if you know what you're doing. Not only are the levels neither too long nor too short, but they also reward movement skill with speed. The linchpin to it all is the cartwheel move I mentioned earlier, which can also be used for a running start. Sure, it sometimes causes the Kongs to stop in place briefly, but this can be alleviated by jumping out of the move when it ends. It can also help you cross gaps too wide for your normal jump with the coyote frames, as I said, only further enhancing the game's pace. Personally, I consider this sort of thing the mark of a well-designed game. Even if I suck when starting the game out, dying a whole lot, it's all good if I can gradually learn more about it and then apply what I figured out to build up a skill set so that I can get through the game with little to no deaths on subsequent playthroughs. In my opinion, DKC does this extremely well, and even when I'm dying a lot, I don't get agitated because the challenge is more than fair. Well, at least 99% of the time it is. Every now and then, the design can get a little sloppy in regards to the camera, and they may throw a hazard or enemy at you that you won't see until it's too late. For whatever reason, this seems to be the most common in the water levels, namely Poison Pond. With its murky green water that can make it a pain to see the enemies swimming in from behind the borders of the screen, or in the rare vertical section where it doesn't seem to want to pan downwards so you can see where you have to land. For the most part, the camera's functional and it at least makes an effort to pan where you need to see, but occasionally the enemy placement isn't the best, and that's a shame. Besides that, however, I find this game's challenge comes from all the right places, and it's able to hold my attention the whole way through. The thing I like the most, though, has to be the stage set pieces themselves, which provides some solid variety that keeps the game fresh. I wouldn't say this is the most inventive, varied game I've ever played, but I'd still say there's more than enough fun ideas and unique challenges to prevent the game from becoming tiresome for a grand majority of its runtime. There's all sorts of cool stuff here, like these falling metal platforms that force you to act quickly, minecarts that demand precision and a quick reaction time, ropes that swing around, move horizontally as enemies come in from the right of the screen, or require quick jumps by making the Kong slide up or down the rope, flickering lights that ask you to plan your moves carefully around the periods of pitch black darkness, barrel cannons that see you timing your shots to avoid falling into a bottomless pit or accidentally ramming into an enemy, conveyor belt platforms that involve tricky enemy avoidance, and so on and so forth. I think all this stuff is great on its own, and they even vary up the details of how some of these set pieces work between their appearances, such as how the first minecart level has you jumping with the cart, and the other sees you jumping out of it and even between carts, or how the conveyor track initially has you do nothing else but dodge enemies around the platform, and the second gives the platform a gas meter you have to maintain by collecting fuel barrels. I can tell they really tried to prevent the game from becoming stale, and at least if you ask me, they succeeded in this goal. Though I can see why the game could become tiring or repetitive to some people, because like I said, there's still some instances where the levels can feel a bit samey. All four water levels in this game, with the exception of Croctopus Chase, which is a neat concept, play pretty much identically. I'd also say the jungle stages all feel extremely similar, as do the abandoned mine and cave levels sometimes. Although those even have some unique ideas, such as stop and go stations rock crocs. Also, because I have no better place to mention it, I think the boss fights are pathetic even by platformer standards 
and with only a few exceptions like Boss Dum Drum, who drops mooks on you that you have to eliminate, the fights are basically really easy showdowns with what's essentially larger versions of the main enemies. I will admit the huge sprites are kinda cool though. In any event, in the case of Gorilla Glacier, the fourth world of the game, the early levels can also sometimes drag a little bit since you have to clear five of them before you can reach the world's save point, meaning a game over can potentially see you redoing a lot of stuff making the world feel longer and way more stressful than it actually is. Which reminds me, I personally find the save system in the game a little dated. Instead of being able to save whenever, you have to reach Candy Kong in the world map, after which you can talk to her to save the game. Personally, I'm not too bothered by this anymore, and I'm glad there's even a save feature to begin with, but I can see how it can make the game a little bit tough for newcomers. You may have to redo levels you've already cleared if you get a game over late in the world, which can occasionally stunt the pace a little bit, especially with the inconsistent placement of these things. Sometimes they're pretty early on, but other times like Gorilla Glacier, they're rather late. Thankfully, the game is pretty generous with extra lives and features numerous ways to earn them. I already mentioned the fact that the game has colored balloons hidden around its levels shaped like DK's face, which are the physical form of 1-ups. These can be red, green, or blue, and this color determines whether they award 1, 2, or 3 lives respectively when collected. In addition, simply collecting 100 bananas awards a life, and there's a whole, no pun intended, bunch of bananas around the game, and every stage features 4 golden letters that spell out Kong, which also give you an extra life if you can grab all 4. Throughout the game, there's also these golden statues of the 4 main animal bodies, and collecting 3 matching ones will send you to a bonus level in which you collect a bunch of miniature versions of said statues. For every 100 you collect in the time limit, you earn an extra life, and there's even a hidden large one that doubles your amount. To be honest, these get in my way more than anything, since you're kicked back to the checkpoint or potentially even to the start of the stage you were on when the bonus level ends. I usually tend to avoid collecting those statues, but I can see some people finding these really helpful. That's all well and good on its own, but there's one thing that more or less eliminates all potential struggles with game overs and lives. So do you remember how Diddy can't defeat muscular enemies like Crusher and instead bounces off of him? Well, much like the Mario games, getting a kill streak on several enemies without touching the ground actually gives you extra lives for each additional enemy you take out after a certain threshold. So if there's any situations where you can get Diddy stuck in a loop of bouncing on a strong enemy, you could theoretically earn as many lives as you want. Well, as it turns out, there's exactly one spot in the entire game, that I know of at least, with the optimal conditions for this to happen. In Millstone Mayhem, you can allow one of these crushes to fall into the beginning area of the level, and then use the bouncy tire to get on top of this archway. If you then slide down the wall as Diddy, just as the crusher reaches reaches the left edge of the small area, and immediately hold the jump button and left on the d-pad, you'll repeatedly bounce off his head and begin to rack up lives like crazy, at a rate that's about triple the speed of the, the visual counter updates. Hell, doing this trick even reveals that while the visual counter appears to stop increasing at 99 lives, the variable that stores your actual life count still updates internally, so you can have a life counter that has a real value well into the triple digits. I must admit, I personally have way more fun being able to play games without the constant stress of a game over, so I always end up doing this trick whenever I revisit. It. Sure, maybe it's a little cheap, but all it really does is improve the pacing if you're dying a lot, so I'd still recommend doing it. I wouldn't say it decreases how challenging this game is, and it's still going to take plenty of skill to get through it. It's just that you won't have to redo a few levels you've potentially already cleared just because you died one too many times, so yeah. It doesn't completely solve the save point issue since not everyone will know about this trick, but at the very least, there's other things which allow you to earn a bunch of lives if you're unaware of its existence. This also includes another major aspect of the game, which I've occasionally hinted at every now and then throughout this video, but haven't fully delved into quite yet. I'm of course referring to the bonus room system. In every level in the game, except for water stages, there's a few bonus rooms, usually about two or three, hidden throughout. They can be accessed in several different ways, including breaking open certain walls or finding hidden barrel cannons. Once inside, each bonus room features one of several types of minigames, including a short platforming challenge, barrel slots for either items or animal body statues, defeating enemies, completing words by hitting the correct letters in order, and so on. That being said, while these minigames are a fruitful... Oh, God! While they're a decent source of bananas and extra lives, they also serve another purpose. Much like several other contemporary 16-bit platformers, Donkey Kong Country features a side quest for completionists. Next to your save file is a percentage, which increases with each level and boss you clear. Well, entering a bonus room also adds to this percentage. So naturally, to achieve 100% completion, or in this case, 101%, because this is one of those games that has a percentage that goes over 100, you'll have to find every single bonus room. In my opinion, it's pretty cool they decided to add an extra incentive for you to look around each stage beyond just the occasional hidden extra life or animal buddy, but to be honest, I kind of only enjoy looking for these things on a case-by-case -case basis. In many instances, they're cleverly hidden and add a neat explorative edge to the stages, whereas at other times I find them to be a little too cryptic for their own good. For example, in Orangutan Gang, the level with the most bonus rooms in the game at 5 in total, there's a few that require backtracking throughout what feels like half the damn stage with Expresso, so if you lose them at any point, you have to die to try again. This instance got on my nerves after a while, because, I mean, was it really necessary to put in 5 of these damn things in this level and then require a 
bunch of back and forth to find every one of them. Ice Age Alley is a very similar case to that. We have to go left at the very start of the stage to find Expresso, and then drag him through a significant portion of the level to enter its bonus rooms. Like in Orangutan Gang, I find this process a bit too tedious for its own good. I also noticed that a lot of the time there's lacking visual cues for the bonus rooms, so the only real way to track down certain ones is to blindly try breaking open every wall you see, or look them up online. Your choice, I guess. Hell, in Oil Drum Alley, there's even a nested bonus room, or in other words, a room inside another one. In this random slots minigame, you have to somehow intuit that you need to get a single banana on all three barrels, which actually causes you to lose in any other case, which then awards you with a wooden barrel. You then have to grab that thing, jump towards the wall, yes, you have to jump towards the rest to get kicked out, and if done right, a hole will open up on the wall, allowing you access to another bonus room. Ah yes. How did every kid who played this game 30 years ago not think of this? Now I definitely cherry picked the worst example there, but like I said, it's not uncommon for there to be the occasional bonus room that's strangely way more cryptic than the other ones. Sometimes they have bananas that hint at where they are, or there's an obvious area of interest that cues you into the fact that this random automatic barrel cannon or whatnot may lead to one, but at other times you may be left totally in the dark about where the bonus room you may have missed is. It definitely doesn't help that in the original SNES version, there's no straightforward way to know if you found all the bonus rooms in the level, with the only only indication being an exclamation point at the end of the level's name on the world map when you found everything. Side note, I love the creative level names this game has. It gives them so much more personality than the clinical numbering scheme or even the adjective noun zone thing Sonic has going on. Anyway, I'm glad there's at least something in game indicating your progress on the side quest, so it's not a totally blind search, but I still would have liked the convenient status screen of sorts so I could check on demand. Interestingly, the GBA remake actually does add that to the game and allows you to see how many secrets each level has, so that's cool. Also, at the absolute least, if you missed a bonus room and have to re-enter its level to find it, you can just pop back in, nab what you missed, and finally exit the level by pressing start then select. And the game will still count the bonus room. Essentially, the percentage points given by bonus rooms are added to your file right when you find them. And you don't have to beat the entire stage again for no reason for it to update your completion percentage, which is nice. Even still, I personally don't go for all the bonus rooms in this game when I replay it because I feel it adds a lot of guesswork if you don't have them all memorized. When I feel the game is already satisfying to play on its own. Furthermore, and this this may sound kind of stupid, but entering the room sometimes ends up skipping over a section of the level design when you exit them, either from winning or losing. And if you ask me, that kind of cheapens a bit of the challenge. Although on that topic, some of the early stages in this game feature a hidden warp barrel that sends you to the end of the stage when you enter it. I usually think of Minecart Carnage, the first of the two Minecart levels, when this feature comes to mind, because I would always use its hidden warp barrel to skip past what is a fairly early difficulty spike. So that's an option in some stages if you're really struggling, but I don't use them anymore because, well, again, with what the bonus bonus rooms sometimes do, I don't like completely skipping over a challenge, unless that can be done with a skillful use of the game's moveset in some way. Needless to say, that's not what this is, so I don't use them, like I said. Oh yeah, and I also don't tend to hunt down the bonus rooms because, at least in this first game, the reward is kinda lame. You don't unlock anything special for finding the bonus rooms, nor does the ending significantly change. Your only reward is getting a little bit of extra dialogue from Cranky at the end and that's it. So yeah, I just tend to stick to the bare essential playthrough when I come back to DKC1, and that's good enough for me. I completely understand understand why someone may find going for 101% more fun than the standard any percent, but as I said, I honestly find the latter more fun to come back to. This whole side quest was a great concept, I just think it could have used more fleshed out, refined execution is all. Sadly, I kind of feel the same way towards the game's finale, which if you ask me, feels a bit anticlimactic and rushed. The main thing that colors this opinion is the sixth and final world in the game, Chimp Caverns, which I find underwhelming. Don't get me wrong, it has some pretty good stages in it, and they're appropriately challenging for this late in the game, but it feels like we're just doing yet another world in a video game and nothing more, instead of reaching the end of a journey across DK Island, if that makes sense. Chimp Caverns is the second cave world in the game after Monkey Mines, and in my opinion, it doesn't do enough to stand out from that world besides being harder. It's a setting we've basically already seen before, and the levels, while trickier and even quite fun, still don't make me feel like I'm in a rush to get DK's bananas back, because they largely have ideas we've seen before, or at least ones that don't jump out to me as extremely inventive. In fact, the more I think about it, the more Chimp Caverns being the final world strikes me as puzzling, because there's another world that I feel would have capped the game off extremely well. Creme Croc Industries. Think about it. That world has treacherous factories and intense triumphant music playing in the background of many of its levels, which I'd argue gives it a strong climactic appeal anyway. But then you have the fact that we're literally traveling through the Kremlin base of operations on DK Island. It would have been a no-brainer for this to be the last place we visit, and they could have framed the game's ending around not only getting DK's stolen bananas back from the factories, but also dismantling the Kremlin's base from the inside so that they're driven off the island for good and don't try another stunt like this ever again. 
or until the next game comes along. And that would have been awesome, at least in my opinion, anyway. Instead, we make it to the nature of DK Island for Four Worlds, then suddenly reach the Kremlings HQ, and then go back to a random place on the island before finally reaching their leader. It feels oddly paced, almost like Kremp Croc was originally supposed to be the last world, but for whatever reason that changed late in development and Chim Caverns was hastily created to fill that role instead. I have no way of proving that, obviously, but that's how it feels. Honestly, a huge missed opportunity to make this game's finale stand out even more. It's not like I'm asking for a huge narrative focus, but even the simplest of stories in video games having well thought out pacing and attention to detail can leave a lasting impression. In other words, a little can go a long way. But that aside, once you get through platform perils, it's time for the showdown with the Kremlin King. Well, right after you fight another huge bird, Master Neki Sr., who's basically the same as his junior variant, except for the fact he spits multiple nuts. Are you fuck? He spits multiple projectiles in a row you have to quickly avoid. Oh, oh yeah, and he's purple. I can't forget about that revolutionary change. Then after that boss, you kind of just unceremoniously get the King K rule and face off against him on the Gangplank Galleon, his huge pirate ship. I must say, it is cool how if you pay attention throughout the game, you can gradually see the ship get closer to DK Island after you beat each world, after which it finally drifts close enough to the island for the Kongs to board it. Cool little detail, but I think it would have been even cooler if, like I said, Cram Croc Industries was the last full world, and there was a little more build up to the fight with the King. Like maybe one last stage where we're platforming over the water trying to reach the Gangplank Galleon or something. I don't know how feasible that would have been to actually do, because it may have required creating a whole new tile set and all, possibly even a unique musical track, and I'm not sure the devs would have had enough time, but you know, it's an idea. Regardless, the final boss against King K. Rule is probably the best fight in the game, and that's for a few reasons. For starters, I have to mention that theme song, which I remember having a unique name for whatever reason, but nope, it's just called Gangplank Galleon. The song starts off with a jaunty pirate theme, which I've heard people suggest makes it seem like K. Rule isn't taking the Kong seriously and doesn't see them as a threat. <laughs> Quickly though, the song takes a massive shift, and becomes an intense rock piece just as K. Rule begins to see the Kongs as a little more credible, which is almost always timed with when the fight begins to get trickier in my experience. I can see why the song is so iconic, it's quite befitting of this, uh, massive crocodile monster. Yeah, I'm realizing how weird this must all sound to someone unaware of the context around video games. The fight itself was also the most in-depth in the game, featuring actual patterns in multiple phases. K. Rule initially runs across the ship's deck, then sits on one as he unleashes a flurry of huge cannonballs, and finally jumps across the deck in an attempt to crush the Kongs. I wouldn't say it's an extremely difficult fight by any means, and having played the game so many times I find it fairly easy, but at least it actually tries with its patterns. I mean, the other bosses were really just large enemies, rarely getting very interesting in my opinion, so while the K. Rule fight isn't that hard, I I'd still say it's the best one in the game, and it's already over. Wait a minute, I don't remember the fight being that short. Yeah, I, I could have sworn, wasn't there a third phase where he jumps across the- Oh, you clever bastards. Once you actually beat K. Rule for real this time, DK gets his last giant banana back, thus restoring his entire horde. Then the game just cuts right to Cranky's cabin without any space in between, and he congratulates DK on a job well done, saying he has, quote, made an old man proud as he whacks the shit out of him with his cane. If you haven't found all the bonus rooms, Cranky says he would have found them all if he was playing. Well, if you get everything, he congratulates you. And like I said, that is the only difference between the any percent ending and the one you get for finding everything. So yeah, that's a little lame. To be honest, that's sort of how I feel about this ending as a whole. Don't mistake me, I like the ideas on display, and several things about it are quite great, namely Gangplank Galley and Steam. However, the finale just doesn't really feel like a proper climax to me, and I think they could have gone even further to really cap off this journey across the island, you know? Oh well, at least the ending theme credits can share is downright spectacular. Easily one of my favorite credits themes from any video game. The credit sequence also has a funny enemy roll call, where every enemy shows up in DK's house, and after that, you're treated to DK and Diddy beating the shit out of each other. No, seriously, that just happens. And it's amazing. Oh yeah, and Cranky complains that you took so long, saying he did everything deathless in less than an hour. Yeah, okay, whatever you say, you old coot. That's all I really have to say about Donkey Kong Country. And as you may be able to tell from all this, I love this game. It's not perfect and certainly has several things that I feel are a little unrefined or could use some improvements. Namely, the occasional less than ideal camera, strange world and save point pacing, and bonus room system that has some weirdly cryptic aspects and a lacking reward. But I'm willing to look past those things because the core of the experience is just that well-crafted. This game has really charming and funny presentation, graphics that received the praise they deserved, a wonderful soundtrack, extremely smooth and satisfying controls, 
levels. Very well paced levels with awesome set pieces and an engaging amount of challenge. Basically it's everything I love in a platformer rolled into one. I think Rare really had something special here and got this series off to a fantastic start. Even with all that said, there's still plenty of untapped potential here in this first game. It's great for sure, but I think they could have gone even further with it. They could refine the bonus room system, get even crazier with the level set pieces and ideas, add even more extra stuff to those willing to dig beneath this game's surface, and even rethink how the game and its setting are paced and structured to create something that truly leaves an unforgettable impact. Something you'll never forget about even long after you switch the console's power off. Well, with the monumental success of this game, Rareware would almost immediately begin working on a follow-up. They plan on going all out with this one, taking them what the first game did and refining everything that worked so well. Or at least, that's what they plan to do. Did they manage to create a worthy successor to one of the SNES's greatest hits? Would it truly live up to the high standard that had already been set for this series? Will I ever stop asking rhetorical questions and just get to the goddamn point? Well, that's a story for next time, when I take a look at Donkey Kong Country 2 Diddy's Conquest, which is far and away the trilogy's most beloved entry. You may be able to infer what I think about it, considering the things I've said in this video, and much of my past stuff, but... Oh come on, don't ruin the suspense. And how am I gonna get people to watch? In all seriousness though, thank you for watching this behemoth all the way to the end. And no, I have no explanation as to why it ended up so long yet again. I swear, I always tell myself that the next video is gonna be the one. I make a bunch of huge videos on one topic, and then move on to another one thinking I can say everything I want to say in 30 minutes or less. Then I start writing, and all of a sudden there's a script of 14,000 words spread across 23 pages right in front of me about a 2D platformer. And trust me, I already know that the next video won't be any shorter, so I'd recommend preparing yourself. In any event, thank you for watching, once again, thanks for 1,000 subscribers, and I will see you next time. Peace. I shower you with coconut cream pie.